I am sometimes hesitant to use and to share the same language that we typically share when we say Happy Fourth of July. And the reason is because when I think of the 4th of July, especially 200, 238 years ago, it was not a happy day. Are you following me? In other words, it took and it required pain, blood, lies for the event to become happy. But if you think about it, that's exactly what the Christian life is about. Even when you look at the cross, the cross, 2,000 years ago, is not, it was not a symbol of salvation. It was a symbol of death. Because people who were crucified, they were criminals, they were evildoers, they were people who, quote unquote, according to the law, deserved death. So maybe this morning, part of the reason why you're in this place is maybe to get a glimpse of the dichotomy, the unresolved tension of a happy 4th of July that was birthed out of uh, suffering and blood and pain and death. Maybe you are right now at a crossroad in life where your life is supposed to move this way and for some reason is moving the other way. Maybe in your heart, you want to be a happy person. Maybe you are here and you're like, I deserve to be happy and yet you find yourself at a, again, at a crossroads where maybe things are not as happy as they're supposed to. So regardless of where you are, let me just invite you to open your Bibles in Hebrews chapter 8. That's what we're going to need today. And the reason why we want to continue the book of Hebrews, there are multiple reasons, and tonight and today is no exception, is because Hebrews is the one book of the Bible in the New Testament that helps us to deal with that unresolved tension. And specifically today, when you look at, when you look at what... We celebrate as a nation the gratitude of the freedom of Independence Day. There is no way you can deny the fact that 238 years ago, the goal was not simply to avoid, to disconnect from oppression and slavery and the restriction of freedom. 238 years ago, that's where the journey began, by abolishing the oppression of a foreigner. But ultimately the goal was for us to experience the freedom that according to the folks and to the men and women who signed that independence document back then, they believed that according to the Bible and to the God of the Scriptures, that was a biblical mandate for men and women to pursue and to have the freedom to pursue happiness, to pursue freedom. So this kind of a dual expression of delivering from evil, deliverance from oppression, deliverance from tyranny, has to be reflected on the pursuit of what we're supposed to be and do. And I cannot help it, but just again, just remember what we have been going through um, as a culture and even as a world, as a globe, with the World Cup. See, the World Cup is one of those events that happens every four years, and some of you are really tuning to it. Some of you just found out that there's a World Cup that means saying it. That's cool. You're not different. You're fine. Uh, you're just joining a club that cares less about you know sports or whatever the case may be. But, but here's what I'm going to tell you: the uniqueness, the uniqueness of, of the World Cup, which I don't find in any other sport. And again, some of you are going to be like, "See, that's exactly what I don't pay attention to in the World Cup," because the World Cup has two elements that are just unique to the experience. Number one, this is the only sport that I know that I know that plays and competes for a third place. Nobody does that. You're either going for championship or you don't compete, right? That's it. So again, I didn't create the rules, I'm just enjoying the game. Second thing that makes it kind of a unique, the World Cup is one of those events that is the only event that people get excited when they don't lose instead of winning. So when you look at the experience of this many countries competing against each other, you know, throughout this whole month and a half or whatever it's going on, there's some underdogs that when they go against world powers, sports-wide, and they go against the Germans and against the Italians and against some of those, you know, uh, again, just countries that they have a reputation of, uh, I mean, champions, and 
and they don't lose, they just tie the game, people get excited, yeah, we tied! And I'm like, Man, you shouldn't get excited for not losing, you should get excited when you win. So, so anyways, so in my mind, I, I get the impression that one of the things that we as a nation, especially 238 years later, we have, we have gotten to the place that as a nation, and let me just bring that from the spiritual aspect. As a nation who proclaims to be built on the spiritual, biblical, non-negotiables, we have gotten to the place that now we celebrate the fact that we are not under tyranny, under oppression versus building and unleashing freedom. For some reason, I get the impression that as, as, as a culture, we celebrate the fact that we haven't gotten divorced versus celebrating and achieving oneness. For some reason, we are the generation who are very excited for being in church and being at church, but we lack the fact that we are not the church. So, the Hebrews is the one book of the Bible that I believe that we have journeyed for the last almost four months, because this is uh, part 13, and so you're visiting this morning, I'm just going to give you a little kind of a reason why we look at this. You look at the screen, and this is... Um, this is a conversation on the supremacy of Christ. Because what Jesus did from day one when he showed up on earth, the incarnation experience through Christmas, is basically give us the scenario, the idea, the picture of what was supposed to be that was stolen or twisted or taken away back in Genesis chapter 3. The implication is that if Jesus, according to the book of Romans, is the second Adam, and obviously Adam, back in Genesis, is the first Adam, and because of rebellion and because of missing the point and conformity to, again, celebrating the fact that we have a lost versus achieving a win, has taken us and has distorted the image of God in us, and we lost our ability to fellowship with God. So what Jesus has done, and the book of Hebrews has helped us to do this, he gave us the supremacy of Christ, that now we understand that even though heaven is extremely important, and it's a real place, and it's a real experience for those who put their trust in Jesus, maybe the supremacy of Christ has helped us to understand that the purpose is not exclusively for us to go to heaven, but maybe it's for us to bring heaven to earth. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I am concerned with the generation that we are, that many of us, we look at the reality of heaven so foreign, even though we're Christians, that we conform with simply avoid hell. If you can just take me away from hell, then I'm game, whatever. See, this, that explains, look at me, that explains why some of you are willing to embrace any religion. It doesn't matter. Everything leads to God, right? Or whatever experience you're looking for. It doesn't have to be exclusively through Jesus because that makes you a very narrow-minded if Jesus is the only way, right? But besides, it's not politically correct. And God forbid it will ever offend anybody. So, so here's what I want you to think for a second because on your handouts, the whole scenario of moving from celebrating the, the lack of losing versus achieving a winning world championship in this life, has to be the marriage, please listen to this, the marriage of these two experiences that begun through the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. We don't have time to go through it, but you can read it at home, at home this afternoon. There are no games tonight, so you can read the Bible, I guess, uh, going on. But anyway, so there, there, there's the experience of Jesus having a conversation with the inner circle of the disciples. And basically the question goes like this, what is it that people say that I am? Who, the, who do they say that I am? And some, in their replies, that some say that you're John the Baptist, some say that you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets, and then he goes on and says, okay, who do you say I am? And Peter replies and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus engages in this conversation deeply, says Peter, because there is no revelation from blood or flesh, but it is my heavenly Father who spoke through you, that through this affirmation that I am Messiah, I am the Christ, it is upon that affirmation that I will build my church. And then here is the little phrase that I want you to look at as you fill out the word being different. The difference is that Jesus conveys a message and says, upon this affirmation, I'm not only going to build my church, watch this, 
I'm going to build my church, which this church, it's okay if it celebrates that we haven't lost. But for the church to go from a defensive mode of protecting itself from evil and moves to an offensive mode, the Bible says that he continues the affirmation. He says, not only that I will build my church, but the gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What does that mean? Here is the implication. When you are transformed at the court and you embrace the person of Jesus, not only as the one who can take you to heaven, not only as the one that can free you from hell, but the one that you can embrace and, and literally imitate, literally walk in his steps and bring heaven to earth, is the moment that you understand that now, watch this, now is not about hell causing you trouble or you trying to minimize or trying to manage evil in the world. The principle that Jesus conveys by saying that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church is that now it is the job of hell to stop us. It is the job of the enemy to fear us. And I'm bringing this up because many people, again, when they go into the mode of simply trying to avoid hell, they go through the driving for is fear. And today, I'm just here to tell you, you know, we are supposed to fear only God. And the fear of God is simply His holiness. You do not want to go to hell for many reasons. But the primary reason that I said last week is you don't want to be in hell because hell is the only place. Hell is the specific building place that regardless what the Bible describes as the lake of fire and, fire and eternal torment, those things are minimum to the real expression what hell is. See, hell is the place where humans, for the first time, will encounter, will face the holiness of God without a mediator. And you do not want to do that. You don't want to do that. <laughs> Talking about fear, that's what you fear. So that understanding of a transformation that now you don't fear hell, hell fears you. Second thing, which is what is in there, now you find it in Romans chapter 12. Paul, after describing chapters 1 through 11, basically conveying the in-depth description of how faith is all that is required to be justified. That you are justified and transformed and made righteous before God through faith and faith alone. Watch this, please. Listen. Paul goes into chapter 12 and the, the practical, the, the, the what it means and how you apply it, everything I just gave you for 11 chapters, Paul says, therefore, look at the grammatical conjunction. Therefore, everything I just told you, everything I just conveyed to you that is not by works, it's by faith. Therefore, do not conform to the patterns of this world. But instead, the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here's the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, Paul basically says the way you're going to avoid conforming to what the world celebrates and once again the world celebrates the fact that you have been lost right that's what the world says so as long as you get caught keep on doing it I mean, you're, you're good just make sure that no one find neither the IRS much less your wife just play it in the down low <coughs> so Paul says to avoid that mindset, which is ingrained, which is already automatic in you, you don't have to train anyone to think like that. Paul says you're going to be renewing your. You're going to right here. You're going to renew it. And you're renewing by the transformation of your mind. So please listen to me. The component of an inward transformation, you are a brand new person in Christ with a brand new way of seeing things. When you marry those two things, you're shifting from celebrating that you have it lost. To achieving and going for championship. By the way, I'm glad you asked. Here's what I need you to answer to your question that you're asking. <laughs> this is extremely important because when you disregard what I just told you, if you disregard these two principles, by default, you are going to play it and you're going to try to play it as a hero and you're going to try to get into the mode on your own strength. And in this case, the enemy to conquer struggles, 
to conquer difficulties, to conquer calamities, to conquer other people, to conquer, watch this, to conquer your very own habits that you're supposed to have dominion over, and you 